and Ginny's gonna start. Hey, welcome sun lovers. Thanks to everyone for being here today. Uh, we're getting ready to begin our Connecting the Dots Planet, People and Power. This program was launched initially by Unitarian Universalist Justice Ohio in September, 2021. We meet monthly to provide a platform for issues of environmental justice along with actions that can be performed during or between each of our monthly meetings. Our monthly topics are driven by you and the immediate environmental justice issues that you are confronting right now. So you can learn more about this incredible tree hugger group nicknamed UUJO at UUJO.org. We'll be putting the links in the chat, which will, which will be saved and available on the UUJO YouTube channel. We will also be recording this show and that will be available on the channel also. Uh, so I'm sorry I don't have a, a live video of me, but my system freezes up if I turn the video on. So a picture is going to have to do for now. <clears throat> so to kind of get us grounded, the US Environmental Protection Agency describes environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So with the foundations of equity and goal and the goal of building an involved and active community, today's topic is community solar power, making it more accessible to all Ohioans. Laura Winters from our planning group will open our session with a sunny little reading. And then Linda New will introduce our speakers. So I'll turn this over to Laurel. Thank you. Thank you, Ginny. Um, I'm going to read a couple stanzas from Mining the Sunshine by Amos Russell Wells, who lived around the turn of the last century and um, was a professor. Uh, he attended Antioch and, um, and he also wrote several poems and hymns. Someday, when the hollow mines yield their final grudging toll, when from out those drear confines comes the last black lump of coal, then in chill and dark despair, we shall learn to look on high to the quarry of the air, to the coal fields of the sky. Here, no strike and no combine will disturb the course of trade. Every man will boldly mine in the sunfield unafraid. Every man will take his own fuel to his utmost need, and the sun upon his throne will rebuke our human greed. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel, that was beautiful. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our two speakers today. We have Tom Smith. Tom is a, a retired environmental engineer. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and Chemistry and a Master's of Art in Teaching. Um, Tom is a member of West Shore UUC and is an amazing advocate for accessible solar power in our homes and in our communities. Tom has worked tirelessly to manage the installation of uh, rooftop solar at West Shore UUC in Rocky River and is here today to share his experiences and, and his expertise. Um, Representative Mike Skindle is from District 13, uh, District 13 in Lakewood. He has been a strong advocate for environmental justice and has always made it a priority to advance policies that ensure clean air, clear water and healthy soil in Ohio. Uh, Mike is a driving force behind, or was a driving force behind the establishment of Ohio's renewable energy portfolio standard. Um, he works to advance our job creating wind and solar industry in Ohio. He has sponsored legislation calling for a state ban on oil and gas drilling in Lake Erie. And he, uh, I'm sorry, and he has sponsored legislation banning the injection of fracking waste um, underground in our state. 
Uh, Mike has always been generous with his time and willing to share his insights into his work at the State House. So we are very appreciative that both Mike and Tom are here today. And I thought we would start with Mike, if you wanted to, if you could give us an overview of the two bills that we're looking at. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I should have you write my uh, biography. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, yes, uh, for the 20 years I've been in the legislature, I have, uh, uh, my, prim one, my primary focus has been on environmental issues, particularly uh, the development of renewable energy uh, and cleaning up our, our air and water. Uh, and that is a focus from somebody who comes from a family of coal miners. So uh, my, both of my two great grandfathers, uh, mine coal uh, in uh, the Pakistani Pennsylvania area, as well as Southern West Virginia. And uh, my uh, grandfather and my father also, my, particularly my father when he was younger, uh, mine coal, then he went, uh, he came to Cleveland and worked in the steel factories. Um, uh, but um, uh, what I, I, I've known for, and my, my father kind of instilled in me is we have to get away from those uh, fossil-based fuels and, and try to remove, uh, uh, move towards renewable energy. And my father actually, we, we, I grew up on a small farm and my father tried to uh, uh, do things uh, by establishing uh, small amounts of renewable energy that, that powered our, our home. Uh, I have been asked um, uh, to speak on two bills that have been introduced in the General Assembly this session. Uh, uh, both in House Bill 429 and then House Bill 450. So let me uh, start off with House Bill 429. Uh, this is a, a Democratic uh, sponsored bill um, with the primary sponsors uh, uh, of uh, Representative Casey uh, Weinstein. And uh, um, originally it was sponsored by uh, Representative Stephanie House. Uh, uh, since she has left the legislature, Rep Representative Juanita Brent has, has taken over that role as the other joint uh, sponsor. And uh, 429 uh, is a clean uh, energy jobs bill as well as an environmental justice bill. And it is quite extensive and um, uh, quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but a, a little bit of the uh, overview uh, on this. And um, as stated um, by uh, uh, Representative Weinstein, uh, he said that the, the policy rooted uh, in this bill uh, is uh, uh, economic development, equality, and accountability uh, within um, uh, uh, energy uh, in this state. And uh, one of the primary things uh, it does is it focuses and set up a standard to re, uh, reduce uh, statewide uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, between um, uh, now and 2050. Uh, so it, it's a, a tiered uh, reduction with uh, the goal of 26% uh, reduction by 2025, 50% reduction by 2030, and 100% reduction um, by 2050. Um, and um, the Department of uh, Environmental Protection uh, here in the state of Ohio would be uh, charged uh, with uh, setting up the rules uh, to try to meet uh, those goals. And uh, it's also, uh, EPA is also responsible for tracking um, um, and uh, it's seen uh, uh, how uh, a, a uh, disproportionately impacted communities are impacted uh, by um, uh, fossil fuel energy. Um, in addition, uh, the bill um, sets up an Office of Energy Justice in the Department of Development. Um, there's uh, a, a several funding sources for that, but what its primarily, primary goal is, uh, this uh, Office of Energy Justice is um, uh, to develop clean energy jobs. Uh, and also uh, within that section, uh, it is to um, um, revert the, the adverse wind turbine setback uh, that was uh, put in place uh, uh, now about seven years ago that has basically uh, destroyed uh, 
large uh, uh, wind farms uh, in, in the state. Uh, <coughs> within the Department of uh, Treasury, the, the treasurer is uh, responsible for establishing a clean energy jobs and justice linked deposit program. Um, and um, so basically uh, this is somewhat of a, a loan program. We've used these linked deposit programs uh, in a number of settings and uh, in our communities and, and they're sponsored by the state as well as counties. And um, uh, again, this program would be designed to promote uh, those clean energy jobs and seek um, uh, environmental uh, justice. Those are the primary components. Uh, there are many other components of uh, 429. Now there has been uh, in May here, finally, um, sponsored testimony both by uh, uh, Representative Weinstein and Juanita Brent. And um, uh, hopefully uh, we can get more hearings on it. Um, uh, and we'll have to see what uh, happens. Uh, we need to really uh, you know, reach out to the members of that committee and, and the chair to, to get further hearings. Uh, and I am a sponsor of that bill as well as a, a number of other Democrats. The second bill uh, that was mentioned is uh, House Bill 450, which is primarily a Republican sponsored bill. Uh, it is a bill that I co-sponsored uh, and what it does it seeks uh, uh, to establish community solar. Uh, so what this is, is um, Tom's gonna talk about this, is um, uh, in, in the state we have uh, the, these rooftop uh, uh, solar projects uh, in, in our community. You know that Cuyahoga County, other organizations are really uh, promoting those. Uh, they're doing the, the, the solar co-ops, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in addition, we have the very large uh, uh, solar farms um, uh, in the state. What the community solar is to uh, um, try to cover uh, everybody in between. And what it does is it allows um, um, people to group together, uh, a minimum of, of three users uh, to establish solar in a geographical area and um, um, and it, it can, uh, the basic solar project um, can go up to 2000 megawatts. Uh, and if it is put on uh, a certain distressed uh, lands, such as say a landfill, uh, it can go up to 3000 uh, megawatts. Um, we have to look at the bill very carefully. I, uh, I, when they send out these co-sponsors, they basically summarize the bill. Um, and um, uh, I liked the concept. So uh, when I put my name on this bill, I put my name on because of the concept. Uh, and I have looked uh, and reviewed uh, the basics of the bill. There has been a substitute bill uh, since it was first introduced. Uh, and there's been sponsored testimony on this. And it's brought forward by Representative Lanice uh, from the uh, 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 central Ohio area and also Representative Baldridge, uh, who's actually a former firefighter. Um, both of those are Republicans. I was one of the few Democrats to sign on to it. I think there's just a hesitation of, of, uh, for Democrats to sign on to uh, Republican sponsored bills. Uh, what I do know, one of the reasons that gave me some comfort in this particular uh, scenario is that Representative Lanice is on it. Uh, Representative Lanice joined uh, uh, me and some others uh, to uh, uh, actually introduce legislation for the full repeal of House Bill 6. Representative Lanice did not uh, support uh, House Bill 6, which was the, the corrupt uh, uh, energy bill the, the, uh, that involved the first energy scandal. Uh, and, and uh, the former Speaker of the House, Larry Householder. Um, so uh, Representative Lanise was a strong advocate and bucked her caucus uh, to seek uh, re fully repealing uh, House Bill 6. And I also uh, had legislation to fully repeal House Bill 6. Um, and I, I knew that uh, Representative Lanise um, felt uh, was pretty good on, on some of the renewable energy uh, concepts. 
And so that's why I felt comfortable uh, joining this uh, community solar. It is something that we, we need to fully explore in Ohio uh, and to try to fill that gap between uh, the, um, the individual homeowner or the individual biz business that has the rooftop uh, solar and then those uh, larger uh, farms. And who can take care, uh, who uh, outside of a group of homeowners, um, who else can uh, take advantage of the community solar? Well, it's, it's um, uh, so we have, uh, you know, Amazon that uh, has looked to locate in Ohio and Amazon had uh, wants to try to operate its uh, facilities uh, through uh, uh, renewable energy, particularly uh, solar. Uh, you have Intel um, uh, establishing uh, uh, a manufacturing uh, facility. Uh, and they also are looking for solar. So Google and, and other uh, technology uh, 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 businesses, uh, when they try to locate in a state, uh, what they are looking for is the ability uh, to run uh, their facilities uh, with uh, renewable energies, uh, particularly uh, solar and, and where feasible uh, wind. Uh, so with that, uh, what I'm gonna do, it looks like my uh, uh, 10 minutes or so is up here. Uh, I'll be able to take questions, I think, later, but I'll uh, turn it over uh, to Tom. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mike. I'm very happy to be here, especially to have Mike here to uh, give us the inside story on who wants what in the state house, because that makes a tremendous difference in the end. Um, I originally got interested in solar in uh, 2013, when our church began to look at putting solar on its property. And in 2017, we installed a 198 panel uh, solar array on the roof of the building. It provides 20% of our electricity. That led me to an interest in, well, what are other Unitarian churches doing? There was no database uh, or collected information on this. So I began digging into it. Uh, people said they thought there were about 30 churches doing this, and actually it turned out there's over 140, and many of them had gone through the decision process of, well, should we put it on our roof? Should their roof isn't big enough or it doesn't point the wrong way, the right way, or we've got too many trees? Can't we put it in a field somewhere? And can't we then share it with another church? Uh, could we share it with members of our congregation. And uh, some states were already along the way to community solar. And community solar is um, subject to a lot of definitions, especially by utility companies versus uh, nonprofit groups and so on. And the uh, churches quickly found that uh, it was possible in some states, partially possible in some other states, um, and not possible in other states. Uh, for instance, right now in Ohio, if you said, well, I wanna put solar on my roof, my neighbor wants to put solar on a roof and he owns an empty lot five blocks away. Can we put up solar in that nice open field there and then share the, uh, the gains from that? And the answer is no, because under Ohio rules, you have to, you can't have multiple meters feeding off of one solar array. And uh, also any solar that you want to take credit for as um, on your property has to be on your property or it has to be on adjoining property. So there have to be changes to the PUCO rules or um, some way for us to let's say, get a group together, rent a 10 acre plot in Medina or some other county have an investor or somebody put a solar array there. And then for each of us to share the credit, it does require some changes in uh, PUC regulations. Uh, there is a lot of activity going on in Ohio right now with regard to solar. And if you go to the PUCO website, uh, Public Utilities Commission, you'll see that their list is limited to 50 megawatt applications or above. It doesn't mean they don't look at smaller ones, but 
for their list, they're just looking at the, they're showing the 50 megawatts and above. That is a big solar array. 50 megawatts is a uh, pretty large. Uh, a lot of the ones that you'll see uh, people building commercially are one megawatts, two megawatts. Maybe on top of a large auto plant, you might see a three quarter megawatt system. So 50 megawatts and above, there's a lot going on in Ohio. And Mike was talking about Amazon and so on. That's what they're looking for to provide their sources of electricity. Um, if you look at some of the states where uh, people began to get involved in how can we have uh, community solar, what would it mean? How would we collect the money for it? Would you own it? Would you buy and lease it? Would your electricity from it go up and down with the seasons as it does for a, somebody on your house? You know, they began to get into questions that I think would be of great interest to your group um, in that, well, if we had community solar, what if two people said, oh, I need a lot of electricity. Yeah, I need a lot too. Let's the two of us take up the whole thing. Then they began to say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't sound quite so fair. And instead of our church getting 50% of it, uh, wouldn't it be better if we not only get electricity for the church, but we also get our members getting electricity for their homes? And well, what about other people that live in apartments or condos or whatever? Shouldn't we include them? And then there began to be an environmental justice component. Well, some people will never be able to afford solar because of they have to keep shifting their residence or something like that. Uh, they're permanently renters. Shouldn't we reserve some for them? And, and so this has ended up being part of the consideration, either legally across the state or for each solar garden, each solar array that was put up. If you look, I believe it is Massachusetts, uh, they are so far along with this that you, you can find lists of uh, solar gardens that say, join ours. No, no, join ours. Well, ours, we only require a two week waiting period. Or it, It's actually competitive to get into these community solar gardens um, or for them to get you as a customer, I mean. So it is wonderful that Ohio is considering this. It's wonderful that it's a um, two party consideration. Um, I've been following the development of solar throughout Ohio and uh, rural solar arrays and very disappointed that the legislature put through this uh, rule that local townships can have uh, the say over wind or solar built within their townships, although they have no say over fracking, they only have say over solar. And uh, this has been sort of um, a, a good issue for people on all sides of, of politics because some farmers who find, well, I make $150 an acre renting my land out for hay, uh, somebody just offered me $500 an acre a year if I put solar on my land. And then the neighbors start saying, well, wait a minute, uh, I moved out here for the rural character. I don't want to see solar panels over there, even if you've gotten behind a tree, because when I get up on a hill, I can see the solar panels. And it's becoming almost a libertarian type of issue where the farmer says, wait a minute, you're telling me what to do with my land? Um, and these are rural people who don't like to be told what to do. So the idea of having a uh, solar array is something that's very amenable to a lot of rural landholders. And whether it's a community solar or just solar with one company, um, they, they see it as a good option and a profitable option for them. Um, I think that's about all I, I can say. Uh, right now, I'm sure people have a lot of questions about what is community solar. I mentioned earlier, it can be very confusing because although regulated utilities like First Energy up in our area uh, have these PUCO restrictions, rural co-op, electrical co-ops do not have some of these restrictions. And they have things going called community solar 
and which I would not consider community solar, where the utility puts up some solar rays, issues credits for portions of these to their subscribers, their electrical subscribers who wish, and tell them if this is going to cost a little more than regular electricity. Um, it's in general been my experience that community solar costs less than the electricity that you normally get. So I, I'm kind of surprised to see that um, it's being priced by these rural co-ops at uh, two cents or so a kilowatt hour above what um, you might pay for coal power uh, um, electricity. So there's there's a lot to come on what's this going to cost and who's going to compete, who's going to do it and so on. But if you look in other states like in Massachusetts, uh, it's it's a going concern and it's quite competitive. Time for questions. Yes, thank you so much. So before we go to the q and A, I I want to point out what our action is for today. And I'm uh, dropping this into the chat. Um, you know, this is, <clears throat> Okay, I'm sorry. This is the, the purpose of this meeting is to let people know what issues are facing them in terms of in, in the area of environmental justice. But the other purpose of this meeting is to um, give people the, the, a platform and a space to take action on it. And <clears throat> I'm so sorry, but and the action that we're taking today is to contact members of the committee or your own elected official and, and ask them to move forward on either or both of these two bills, the 429 and the 450. So here's what I'm putting into chat. I'm putting um, a link to a Google Doc that includes, on this Google Doc, you will see um, lists of the people that are in the committee that are considering this bill. You will see lists, uh, you will see a, a copy, uh, a link to a copy of, the, of 429. You'll see a link to a copy of 450. And you will see um, uh, members, people that have co-sponsored each of the two bills. And in addition to that, you will see two sample letters that you could copy and paste and um, send to your um, elected official, or you could look at it for ideas and then write your own, or you could look at it and read it and call and leave a message for to your elected official or to a member of the committee. Um, so I just want to point out that we have in this in this particular um, Google Doc, we have quite a few options of who you should contact. Um, it is what, three pages long, and the the letters are actually on the third page. So you know you can do whichever you choose. Please do one of those actions, either call or send an email. The place that you would go to to send the email is also listed under here, way on the very top. Um, you would go to your directory of Ohio representatives with phone numbers and emails, and that would be, you know, that'll be an easy way to just send an email or an easy way to like call now, put on mute and call now and make a phone call. So the process that we've been following during these meetings is while, you know, in these next 20 minutes or so, while we're doing, while people are doing this action, while people are making the phone calls or sending the emails, we will also open this up for a Q&A. Tom and um, Mike are still here and I know everybody's got a ton of questions. Um, so if Tom and Mike are willing to stay, <laughs> then we, then I would, I would like to share those questions with them. Um, at this point, we have one person who has asked and I think um, Hank probably has other questions in, in addition to that, but the, I'm gonna read from Chad, I'm gonna read the question that I've been given so far. And the question is, and this is for both either Tom or Mike, um, do you see these bills trying to incentivize individual and individual businesses or offering any community collective decision-making to opt for solar? So that was a question that was put into chat. So um, uh, 450, which is the uh, community solar uh, legislation, um, it's designed uh, for uh, a collective agreement of community members to come together uh, to uh, uh, seek to do a uh, community solar project. Um, uh, so, um, and under the, uh, the bill as introduced, 
you need actually three users uh, to come to a minimum of three users to come together uh, to do that. Um, and I, so I, I think it's the goals that uh, Tom uh, mentioned a, a little earlier where the church may want to get together with uh, some of the church members in, in the area and, and develop a, a community solar project that uh, benefits the church or several churches or the church and community uh, and church members uh, in, in that scenario. Um, one of the, and before uh, Tom actually jumps in here, Tom mentioned um, uh, the restrictions on wind, uh, that the, uh, the setbacks, uh, the zoning restrictions on wind, I, and, and the community, uh, uh, the, the local community involvement on wind. I will tell you right now, there is uh, a bill, Senate Bill 61, uh, which is a good bill right at the moment. And what it does, is it deals with homeowners association and it, in certain circumstances, it allows um, uh, a homeowner and a homeowners association to uh, install uh, uh, rooftop solar. Um, there is an amendment um, being considered. It's, that bill is coming to the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, a member is trying to put together an amendment to really restrict uh, solar by requiring um, a landscaping screening and things like that around the solar. Uh, understand that landscaping on something like that would be about um, $400 per lineal foot. It would literally add millions of dollars to a uh, solar project and would put real restrictions in the ability to finance one of these, uh, 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 these projects. So we're trying to beat back that amendment. Uh, that's gonna be considered over the next two to three weeks. And Tom, if you wanted to jump in and add anything else to the question. Uh, no, I, I think you, the question was more specific about what's in the particular bills, which you'd be much yeah. better at answering there. Okay. All right, and um, Hank put in chat, if you would just like to use the raise hand um, icon for, uh, for a feature for, for asking your question as well, that would be fine. But we do have two other questions. The first one, or the second, I guess, would be um, what are the chances of very you know, succinct, what are the chances of either of these bills passing um, you know, in your estimation? Um, so in the legislature, um, um, the current, legislature is very adverse to promoting, um, for the most part, uh, any type of real uh, renewable energy um, uh, production uh, in this state. Uh, they, they tend to continue with restrictions. Um, I do not believe the, uh, the Democratic bill, which is the uh, Clean Energy Jobs Environmental Justice Bill, House Bill 429, um, um, we really have to uh, continue to uh, have grounds, a groundswell of, of people writing into the committee supporting that bill to even get additional hearings. I, I think the goal would be try to get more additional hearings uh, on that bill. The community solar actually, uh, maybe not this session, uh, it could be this session, uh, but it would be lame duck. Um, um, I think has maybe some chance uh, of moving forward, whether this session or next session, uh, after further discussion. Uh, th uh, there might be, because it's a, a Republican-based bill, uh, it has bipartisan support. Um, uh, the, the goal, though, is to make sure that the bill um, does more good than harm. Okay, all right, That's is that, Tom, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I just want to make a comment that uh, Mike before talked about the uh, the allowance on this community solar bill of up to two and a half, and I think believe three uh, thousand megawatts. I think I was maybe thinking some people are three thousand. I think it's uh, for the distressed land. It's uh, up to a thousand, and other properties, it's up to two thousand. Up to two thousand. 
well, if if this could be realized altogether, 3,000 uh, megawatts, if some of you aren't familiar with the counting system, a uh, 1,000 megawatts is approximately the power of a large nuclear power plant. So that's a gigawatt. So if three of these, you're, you're talking about the equivalent of three good-sized nuclear power plants uh, in solar, that's a lot of acreage. So we're, we're talking about a lot of solar being uh, produced in the, in the state of Ohio. The, uh, the experience of some states in getting community solar has uh, been a rocky path because of restrictions of, well, the, you can join community solar, but it has to be in your county or the adjoining county, or it has to have 50 or more subscribers or um, some of the original subscriptions were required that you had to sign up for 20 years and you had to uh, give six months warning to get out or something. And yet the ones in Massachusetts I see are becoming very easy to get in and out, much like our, uh, our deregulated electricity supplier system is, uh, apples for apples in Ohio. So it just depends on what uh, the sausage that comes out at the end of this uh, uh, I'm amazed. I, I think it's a wonderful bill, and I, I hope it goes through. And I see some of the amendments coming through are trying to uh, meet everybody halfway. And uh, um, my my original question on this was, well, if you're if this isn't on my property, then somebody else is producing prop, uh, electricity in my name, and right now at our church we do not get full credit for electricity sent back to the grid so right now so with a community solar you'd be talking about all of the electricity going to the grid and then you getting what's called virtual net metering because it's not your meter it's not actual net metering it's virtual net metering and right now when our church sends electricity back into the grid um First Energy, as the distributor, does not give us any credit for that. We only get credit for the electricity generator, which is like five cents out of 13 cents. But I see the amendment is talking about it has to be 13 cents and something about the utility gets two cents. So um, I, I think it sounds very good so far that the utility gets something out of this and that would uh, maybe do something about since this whole thing is going to be net metering all it's all going to be put into the grid and then somebody else gets credit for it um i don't know if you've ever talked about renewable energy credits before those of you in the nopec region i, I see the lakewood city council is just going to get a, a a bill to have nopec buy renewable energy credits so that anyone in lakewood can say that we are using uh, renewable electricity. Um, so some of these community solars really are very similar to that. Somebody has a set of panels somewhere and they are um, saying, well, this electricity put into the grid is put in in your name and here's a certificate. So it's like a renewable energy credit where you are paying for the right to say you produce this electricity. So there's a lot legally that's going to have to be done as to how is this promoted. And first of all, who who puts up the uh, the panels? Uh, right now, I would think that any developer could go to find some land that somebody like anywhere in Ohio, all these large uh, installations, somebody's finding somebody who owns land and is willing to lease that land for the next 20 to 30 years. And uh, the developer then would say, all right, this is open now because of the Bill 450 to anyone in Ohio or maybe only in adjoining counties or whatever the legal description is in the end. So uh, there's a lot of questions as to exactly how are you going to get credit, exactly who is going to build these, how are you going to subscribe to them, and um, uh, I think We've got a lot of good examples in other states that we can follow. 
That's fantastic. So this has a lot of potential, but we there's a lot of questions about what how exactly it's going to be done. Um, the next question that just came up was, do the investor owned utilities have to allow their wires under these bills? If so, I'm sorry, the use of their wires under these bills. If so, what are the economics and um, what can they charge? And I think, Tom, you were kind of addressing that or have you yeah. addressed that? Yeah. Uh, right now, through the Apples to Apples program, you can switch uh, whoever your generator is. You can get electricity generated in Wyoming. And somebody can say, well, it was put in the grid over there. And I'm declaring that the electrons coming out here are the share that was put in the grid over there. And you are therefore the, uh, the person who is using this electricity and you get credit for using renewable energy from wind or from solar uh, because uh, either we bought renewable energy credits that say we get to take credit for this uh, or we actually generated it and we are distributing it to whoever subscribes to our electricity. Um, renewable energy credits are a bit hard to understand, but let's take the, the example of our church. We produce 75,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. A renewable energy credit is sold on the market in 1,000 um, kilowatt hour units. So we would have the right technically to sell 75 renewable energy credits each year. Uh, the last I heard the market in Ohio was like $5, so it's not worth worrying about. Um, but when you sell those credits, you are selling the right to say that you are using those electrons. So if the people who put panels on our church sold renewable energy credits, legally, they could not say that our church uses solar energy, or we could not legally say that we use uh, solar electricity because we sold that right to somebody else. And the person who bought those renewable energy credits would be just like the proposal in uh, Lakewood where NOPEC says, well, we're gonna go to somebody with a big solar field. We're gonna buy the right to say that we are the exclusive users of that electricity and we're going to pass that on to our subscribers in, in the Lakewood area, let's say. Um, so in a sense, a community solar is sort of like this. Somebody's going to put up an array in one area, and instead of selling it all to um, some electric company so that they can say we use 10% renewable energy or whatever, they could say, well, we're going to sell pieces of that to individuals to say that we use that in our house, just like uh, through NOPEC in, uh, in Lakewood is, as being proposed. So um, it, it's very hard to wrap your head around this if you haven't dealt with it before, but the, the legal niceties so far with this bill seem to be going along very well. And I really encourage support for this. Uh, it's, it's like getting started with solar in the first place. Community solar is its own little animal. And um, it takes a lot of agreement all around as to how is this going to be managed. Okay, all right, that's fantastic. So um, I we have two, two short questions and one long one. I'm gonna read one of the short ones. Um, the first one is, uh, which bill is someone trying to amend to add a landscaping requirement? Yeah, so uh, it's Senate Bill 61. Uh, it went through the Senate. It's uh, The sponsors are uh, Senator uh, Lou Blessing and Senator Nikki Antonio. It deals with uh, updating laws on homeowners association, and that includes uh, the condo associations. Um, in that bill in the Senate, they put a provision uh, regarding uh, condo uh, homeowner uh, rooftop solar. Uh, so if you own a condo and you also own the roof, the uh, condo association, unless there's a deed restriction, cannot restrict your right to put solar on your roof. 
they, you know, they can uh, uh, put some things on there for you to shield it or whatever, but they can't really restrict you from putting that seller up is what the amendment does. The bills come through to the house. We, it, it was in a committee I sit on. It was voted out of committee and now waiting to go on the floor of the House of Representatives. And my understanding, uh, there's a representative from central Ohio who doesn't like a, a solar farm uh, in his district because the neighbor is complaining for the same reason Tom mentioned earlier is that because they see the solar panels and they don't like it. Um, and actually they see the solar panels off of Interstate 71 south of Columbus. And uh, so this particular representative uh, wants to put uh, language in there requiring these uh, solar farms uh, um, to put screening around the entire complex, which could add uh, uh, for uh, uh, a, one of the smaller solar farms, it could actually add a million or $2 million to the cost of the project uh, and more uh, $4 million for a larger project. So that amount of money uh, can actually break the project and make it uh, not feasible financially. So it's uh, Senate Bill 61, uh, and um, uh, we have to see what happens. If they amend this into this bill, it go, the bill will go back to the Senate for the Senate to concur in the Senate amendment. And I, both, I understand that both uh, Senator Lou Blessing and Senator Nikki Antonio will recommend to the Senate to send it to conference committee um, um, to try to deal with this amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think our final question is, uh, could you talk about the Republican bill calling for the PUCO to give an annual report to the members of the legislature on the amount uh, of community solar built under the law and how necessary it is? Um, is there a danger that the PUCO will be biased against solar energy and give a negative report? And I think that is in 450. Yeah. Um, um, I, I am not um, that familiar with that provision. Uh, we are concerned uh, that um, the PUCO has not uh, looked upon uh, renewable energies uh, uh, real favorably uh, in the state. Um, and uh, we are concerned that uh, a report by the PUCO uh, may be uh, skewed. Um, uh, the good thing is uh, we've got the Consumer Council uh, kind of watching over them on it. And, uh, um, but yeah, we, we have to be careful of uh, that type. We, I think uh, reporting uh, is transparent and is necessary as long as the, the data good and the conclusions uh, 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 match the data. And that might also be something that you want to talk about in the email or the phone call that you make to the committee members that you write to your legislator that you know you you want if there's data that's going to be shared if there's that transparency you want it to be accurate and you want it to be fairly um, assessed. So uh, I if there are oh, I'm sorry I think I, is there. All right, so um, we have a website that was shared on the in chat if everybody want, if anyone wants to take a look at that that sounds like it could be an interesting it's a cpa.coop um and i think that is all the questions we have at this point so actually have a topic if you have a, a moment if i sure. could actually tom may be knowledgeable in this um and uh, he can address it but tom could you address uh so with the church or a homeowner having solar, my understanding is so that solar feeds that electricity uh, in back into the grid on from your rooftop, whether it's your business, your church, or your home um, here in Ohio. So you will get a credit uh, for that use, uh, but but if you actually create more energy than what you're using. Uh, you actually, First Energy or, or the utility does not pay you any money for that here in Ohio. They hold that for you, but they, they technically don't uh, uh, pay you for the excess electricity. Is that correct, Tom? Uh, 
for I think for almost all of us, we had an electricity bill that has two parts. One is the unit, the business that delivers the electricity to us. And one is the generator who may be simply an office somewhere that buys electricity around the country, aggregates it, and then sells it. Um, at our church, we pay about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Of that, about five cents is to the generator who produced the electricity. And then the rest goes to the illuminating company, which is the subsidiary of First Energy that delivers it over the poles and maintains the wires and the transformers and so on. And if you look at um, net metering for Ohio, the uh, First Energy has its net metering agreement online. And you'll see that they say right there, they only will give you credit for the electricity cost from the generator, not for them. They are in the delivery business and their viewpoint is, we spent eight cents for every kilowatt hour sent to you, delivering that to you. Now, you essentially got five packages from Amazon You'd only, you only you don't want five, you only want four. You want to give one back and say, well, I shouldn't have to pay for delivering that one that I don't want. Their view is, no, we delivered five packages. We're going to charge you for five packages. We don't care what you want to send back to Amazon. Um, we're, we're, we're getting paid for what we delivered. So what we find is that 20% of our electricity um, is produced by the solar panels and First Energy or the illuminating company has no idea how much electricity our panels are producing because they never, nothing goes through the meter. We have a two-way meter now and the electricity generated on the roof that goes down into the church gets used in the church. There's no record of it on our meter because it bypasses the meter. It's behind the meter. The, on a hot summer day where there's nothing going on at the church, we'll, use it to run our air conditioners. And if we have extra, it goes back into the grid. But instead of, we only get five cents for that electricity and we get credit straight off of our bill from the generator. But uh, the best thing for us to do is to just use the electricity because then that saves us 13 cents. But if it goes back into the grid, um, then we're only gonna save five cents on that. So the question then for panels that are essentially off site from the church, like in community solar, it's all going into the grid. Now, what is First Energy going to say about that eight cents there that they put poles out to that solar panel field somewhere and are they going to give us credit for the eight cents or not? So I see one of these amendments was about the 13 cents and giving the utility company two cents and so on. So uh, that's, that's all gonna come out in the end, so. Thank you for that explanation, Tom. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so I am going to, at this point, turn this over to Laurel. It is five minutes before six and we wanna make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, Laurel has a few closing comments. Next month. Sure. I'm sorry, we... can, I, can, I, can I jump in for a second to add to the answer to the last question? So it's my understanding that AP Ohio will give you full credit for any electricity you push back onto the grid from your home solar system. It's not a reduced rate for AP Ohio. And I think some of the other energy suppliers is the same way. It varies from energy supplier to energy supplier. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, Laurel. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, next month, we will look back at nearly one year of connecting the dots. Join us for a conversation with our volunteers and learn more about how you can get involved. This will be on Sunday, June 26th at 5 p.m. And um, Pastor Hank is going to be putting links into the chat. 
our planning team meets on Mondays at 7 p.m. And uh, you can join our group by emailing UUJO environmental justice at gmail.com. And, um, and our Google group as well, which is even longer. So I hope that's going into the chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go to the YouTube channel for a list of all the resources shared here this evening. Um, we've got a shorter bit.ly for that. And um, please ask us for any needs. Do you have an issue coming up you would like to bring to a Monday planning meeting? Our June meeting will be a review and discussion and, um, and of what we want to address in the future. What topics would you like to see for July and going forward? Um, we've talked about focusing on plastics coming up, but if you have some other things you're interested in, please let us know. And now I have some closing words from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of UUJO, thank you all <clears throat> very much for being here this evening, especially uh, Tom and Mike, our speakers. We really appreciate your time. Thank you uh, for making environmental justice a priority. Uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh, so take a look and we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a good evening, be well. Thank you.